Hearing will come to order, please. I say to my colleagues on the committee, it's our first meeting this year. Welcome back. And I, we have a very, uh, I think it's a very auspicious beginning in our effort to continue to try to help the administration coordinate a anti-drug policy that will reap benefits for not only our country, but for the countries of the three distinguished uh, members of our panel this morning. And it's a great honor for us uh, to uh, have uh, three ambassadors, uh, Colombia, Bolivia, and Peru, representing their governments here this morning at this hearing. And I want to, uh, in advance, thank them for their courtesy. And uh, for the record, thank them for the many meetings that we have had uh, in my office over the last six months uh, and their sincere effort to uh, both uh, inform me, educate me, and uh, seek common ground as to how we can cooperate among our four countries to help make progress on what we all believe to be a terrible scourge that we are faced with. Today's hearing is the second in a series of three joint hearings conducted by the Judiciary Committee and the International Narcotics Control Caucus in preparation for the Andean Summit scheduled for next month. We're honored, as I said, to have with us three distinguished representatives of the nations that will be attending that summit. Before I make my opening remarks, I want to publicly express a sentiment that uh, I'm sure that most Americans share. Mr. Ambassador, the American people know the great effort that your governments are making and the personal risks that you personally and your fellow office holders and uh, officials in your country take on a daily basis in order to fight the narco terrorist and the drug scourge that plagues uh, all of us now. And the great price that your people have paid, particularly in the recent uh, months and year, uh, in order to, uh, if you will, allow you to continue uh, that effort, which you have done with uh, uh, some significant degree of resolve. It uh, really, quite frankly, uh, surprised me, as I said to the ambassador from Colombia on the way down the hall, the events of yesterday and the drug cartel releasing two very prominent uh, hostages, and with it a statement uh, seeking, uh, uh, I'm not quite sure as I read the statement what they were seeking, um, but they alleged to be seeking uh, an end to the effort on the part of the government in return for end of their efforts and involvement. And I was extremely pleased, although it's presumptuous of me to suggest what any other head of state or any head of state should or should not do. But as an American citizen, I was pleased and uh, impressed by the resolve that President Barco showed by suggesting that uh, he is going to carry this uh, to the end. And uh, those of us on this committee want you to know, all of you, that we uh, plan on carrying this to the end with you. Uh, for uh, you, uh, like us, are highly skeptical that the latest offer from the narco-terrorists, their offer to retire with their billions of illegal profits to enjoy a peaceful life of luxury, uh, while our nations continue to suffer the effects of misery they foisted upon us for the past several decades, is an offer that is likely to be uh, um, followed through on. I indicated to you, and I will repeat in this public session, that my purpose here, our purpose here today, is uh, not to discuss uh, Panama. Uh, that was the appropriate vehicle for that is the Foreign Relations Committee. It is not to discuss your attitude towards recent actions uh, relative to Panama. It is not to uh, seek to ask you uh, ahead of time what the uh, positions of your governments will be at the summit conference. And it is clearly not for purposes of attempting to, in this forum, uh, 
shed additional light on the differences some members of this committee have with administration policy. It is to deal with several things. One, you get your input on whether or not additional cooperative efforts with regard to sanctions policy, policy to uh, um, police-oriented, military-oriented policy, is possible, and if so, under what circumstances. Two, to discuss what most of us believe to be an essential relationship between efforts on enforcement and economic efforts to provide alternatives for the peoples, particularly the growers in your country, to be able to have an alternative uh, to what is now, in two of your countries, a relatively main, strong mainstay agricultural crop. And uh, three is to discuss with you the greater need for coordination uh, between our nations on uh, between uh, our trade representatives on the one hand who uh, fail to negotiate a coffee agreement which costs uh, uh, your three countries in excess of uh, 700 million dollar uh, billion dollars and uh, and cost uh, 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 Colombia 400 million dollars while we're talking about aid packages that are well intended and meant uh, to be helpful that uh, add up to much less an impact on your economy than the loss that results from the, from the uh, uh, failure of the coffee agreement. And, uh, and thirdly, to discuss with you what you and your governments think we in the United States can and should be doing. You have said to me privately that uh, uh, the export of automatic weapons is, uh, is a bane to the existence of your police officers. Uh, you have indicated to us that precursor chemicals are, are uh, uh, very, very uh, uh, important in terms of our attempting to uh, uh, prevent their transshipment to your countries. And so, in short, gentlemen, we're here as friends to discuss with you those things which you think are most important that should be done at this point and to raise questions about past policy initiatives to determine whether or not we can make improvements upon them in what we all have committed to, and that is the fight against the narco-terrorist organizations. I would now uh, yield to my colleague from Utah to see if he has an opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I commend you for arranging this hearing on this very important matter affecting the lives of all Americans and people throughout all of the world. No longer can the problems of drugs uh, be limited to our local communities, towns, cities, or states, or to our individual country. The scourge of drugs pays no heed to race, uh, region, economic status, or national boundaries. In reality, the problem is multidimensional, and, multi and, and it is global. If we are to win the war, it has to be waged on, at every level and in all countries. There are no more tomorrows, Mr. Chairman, and I know you and the rest of my colleagues and the President understand and share this. We as a nation, as a region, and as a world are losing this war. And the time is now for all of us as individuals and as leaders and for all nations to assume the responsibility, therefore. The future of our world and our children's world demands no less. Now, having just returned from a fact-finding trip to South America uh, with our distinguished uh, minority leader, Senator Dole, I can report that there is some reason to be optimistic. While plenty of work and more work needs to be done, the leaders of the countries of this region are taking the war on drugs seriously, and I commend their representatives who have joined us today. We appreciate your leadership and your commitment to fighting this problem, and we want to assist you in these efforts. The United States alone, however, cannot assume the total responsibility or cost of combating drugs nor can we be expected to deal with the problem effectively without supporting and, and being supported by other countries. Increased cooperation by our countries will result in better results. Now, as the major producers of coca and cocaine, your countries have a key role to play in ending the drug scourge. Drug cartel operations and associated local insurgencies are a real and present danger to democratic institutions national economies, and civil order. We understand these pressures your countries are facing, as well as the limited nature of your resources. The United States has its own share of domestic problems in fighting drugs, 
We have to continue pursuing education, treatment, and criminal enforcement programs, as well as addressing other underlying social problems. Unfortunately, U.S. Uh, resources are also limited. The President has pledged $125 million in additional aid for your country. Continued law enforcement, military, economic, and development assistance, as well as old uh, aid that we have given in the past and aid with foreign debt and foreign investment uh, are all coming from this country and we hope will come with greater results in the future. Meeting extradition requests such as uh, with alleged drug trafficker Lu Luis Arce Gomez uh, indicates your seriousness. When we were in Venezuela, we suggested that uh, Romero Benedetti be extradited. Uh, he certainly is uh, not a citizen of Venezuela and he's been in jail for two years and there's no question in our minds that he is a drug trafficker and he literally ought to be treated as such. During my visit to South America, I heard a lot about the three D's, drugs, uh, uh, debt, and democracy. And the war on drugs has to be waged on all fronts, including interdiction, law enforcement, education, research, development, and rehabilitation. More work is needed in eradication and the administration of justice. And we're concerned with the paces uh, of interdiction and eradication. Coca cultivation continues to increase throughout the region from roughly 275 metric tons in 1985 to roughly 455 metric tons in 1988. And I think our efforts have to be improved. And U.S. aid can only be justified by progress in the war on drugs. I believe that strong leadership will bring strong rewards. What has been done does encourage us. The trip was a worthwhile one. But I think more has to be done. We can look forward, I hope, to cooperation with your countries. And I hope that this nation will do a more effective and more intelligent job in dealing with you and helping you with these problems. Uh, I, to that extent, again, I want to compliment our chairman uh, for holding these hearings and helping us to get to a point where we will understand what is in the best interest of everybody here and how the United States of America can assist and be a partner rather than uh, just sitting up here moaning and groaning about it. To the extent that you have uh, helped us, we certainly appreciate it, and we hope that we can do even more in the future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Senator Kennedy. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I, too, want to join Ms. Senda Hatch in expressing our appreciation for commending having these uh, hearings uh, this morning on this extremely important aspect of the uh, whole uh, drug policy, any drug policy. And I two want to join in welcoming three very distinguished representatives of their countries. As you pointed out so well, uh, Mr. Chairman, at the beginning, uh, this isn't just a, a political uh, issue in these uh, countries. These are matters of life and death. Uh, many of those that are gathered or here or this morning have demonstrated their own very uh, strong personal courage, taking uh, strong positions against some extraordinary uh, odds. And they are individuals uh, who have, I think, have served their country well. And we look forward to hearing uh, their guidance uh, this morning, because as we all know, we are partners in this effort, co-equal in this uh, battle, learning from each other. And it's important that uh, we uh, understand that at the very uh, beginning. Our policy in the Andean countries there is one piece of the larger strategy that we must follow in the comprehensive war against drug abuse and trafficking. Effective law enforcement and demand reduction in the United States are as essential as halting narcotic production at the source. We meet here on the eve of two major events with long-term consequences for our policy. National Drug Director William Bennett will release his second national drug strategy in two weeks and the International Drug Summit will take place on February 15th in Colombia. All of us are well aware that the U.S. military intervention in Panama has complicated the drug summit. Whatever our differences on that issue, all of us hope that the summit will be helpful and that it will generate a new spirit of cooperation in meeting the ominous and deadly drug challenges that plague all our nations. We also regret the unfortunate controversy over the administration's proposal to locate U.S. warships off the coast of Colombia. I look forward to hearing the views, witnesses' views, on how to develop effective radar facilities for use against drug traffickers. 
We know that efforts to rely on crop substitution in the Andean region have not been as successful as we had hoped, and that cocoa farmers continue to resist efforts to shift their crops to significantly less profitable commodities. We must support successful crops like coffee, and I intend to work at early reinstatement of the International Coffee Agreement. The U.S. complicity in a suspension last year was a mistake. It served only to undermine the countries whose help we need most on the front lines in the drug war. What is needed now is financial assistance for alternative economic development. That will require capital to encourage the development of industries to keep workers and farmers out of the cocoa fields. Innovative bold programs are essential, including investment incentives and guarantees. We should also consider preferential trade treatment for products that have traditionally been exported to the United States from the Andean region. The cooperative effort is also needed to bring greater law enforcement pressure on the traffickers at the source. We know that traffickers rely on sophisticated weapons, chemicals, and money laundering from the United States. Strong action in these areas in this country can have direct effect uh, in source countries. In particular, it's clear that traffickers rely on large numbers of assault weapons manufactured or purchased in the United States to protect their shipments and personnel. This insidious supply of weapons from the United States should be cut off as soon as possible. Similarly, U.S. chemicals used to turn cocoa leaves into cocaine continue to turn up in clandestine laboratories. And recent successes in money laundering investigations demonstrate that intensified efforts against illegal drug profits can yield results. Finally, we also recognize that cocoa production in the Andean region will decline as demand for cocaine falls in the United States. We need to strengthen our own demand re reduction programs, especially in the areas of treatment and prevention in order to turn the corner on public attitudes and practices in the United States. I look forward to the hearing as an opportunity to explain these ideas and to learn from our distinguished guests and how we best work together to rid our hemisphere of this uh, common evil. And I would uh, sincerely hope uh, that our, our friends here, when uh, they make uh, their presentation, uh, might include in their own words um, what advice uh, they might give uh, to the uh, the president of the United States. We really are in this uh, together. Uh, we're in this as uh, allies and as uh, friends and uh, and co-equals. And in that spirit, I'd be interested uh, in what advice you might uh, give uh, to our president and to us about how we can be more effective. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, gentlemen. You are. Uh Many witnesses aren't accustomed to the, op the idea of listening to members before they speak, but being diplomats, I'm sure you're very, very well accustomed to it. I'd like, we have one more very important uh, opening statement by our ranking member, uh, the Senator from South Carolina, Senator Thurman, and then we'll ask you to speak. Thank Senator you, Thurman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, we get a day to consider our nation's foreign drug policy as it relates to the Andean countries of Colombia, Bolivia, and Peru. Firstly, all of the cocaine sold in the United States is derived from cocoa grown in these three countries. Today, we will hear testimony from the ambassadors regarding current efforts to eradicate cocaine and to improve international efforts in that region to address the drug problem. In addition, today's discussion may touch upon proposals to forgive debt owed by the Andean countries to the United States if they cooperate in combating narcotics trafficking. Although debt forgiveness is an alternative to considering the war on drugs, several concerns have been raised, such as the, as the precedential effect such a step would have. Without question, cocaine and the individuals who traffic, in, traffic it throughout the world have caused untold <clears throat> misery for millions of people. Last fall, President Bush presented the nation with a comprehensive strategy for addressing the drug crisis, the National Drug Control Strategy. A major aspect of this strategy is the Andean strategy, which is aimed at motivating the governments of Colombia, Bolivia, and Peru to cooperate with the <coughs> United States in significantly damaging the cocaine industry while proceeding with anti-drug efforts of their own. In the final days of the last session, Congress passed the International Narcotics Control Act of 1989, which provided the administration with $261 million to implement the Andean strategy. 
The challenge presented to our nation by the Andean strategy requires the implementation of a comprehensive and sustained multi-year effort involving economic, military, and law enforcement support. The implementation of the Andean strategy is currently underway, and the countries represented here today are consulting with the administration in detail. As the United States continues to negotiate and plan with the governments of these host nations, I am confident that the Andean strategy will prove to be a success. President Bush has already taken significant steps to show the world that America is prepared to fight the war on drugs on all fronts. In an unprecedented move last August, President Bush announced that he was rushing a 65 million emergency aid package to Colombia. <coughs> the package included over 20 helicopters, boats, jeeps, weapons, and other equipment. A number of military advisors have also been sent to the Andean countries. In addition, a major figure in the international drug trade, General Manuel Noriega, had been captured in a waste trial in Miami along with his co-defendants. The efforts of the Andean countries merit recognition. For example, President Barco's launching of a campaign of confiscations, arrests, and extraditions against the drug cartels has dealt a major blow to international drug trafficking. However, despite these efforts, the violence perpetrated by the drug cartels has increased rather than subsided, especially in Colombia. As to the drug cartels, they must not be permitted to bring the international efforts to a premature end and thorough and through threats and acts of violence. The efforts of these countries with the assistance of the United States must be relentless. Such relentless efforts resulted in the death of one of the Medellin cartel's most notorious leaders, Rod Reek, the Mexican gotcha. As these efforts continue, there are signs that the cartels are growing weary. For example, it was reported yesterday that the Medellin cartel has offered to halt its violence and drug exploitation in exchange for unspecified legal and constitutional guarantees from the Colombian government. In closing, the fight to rid the world of the drug cartels and cocaine will not be an easy one. Yet when faced with the alternative, the crime, violence, and suffering caused by cocaine, our resolve to continue the fight must be stronger. We simply cannot give up. The increase in drug violence and usage worldwide strengthens my commitment to continue the war on drugs and to provide assistance to foreign governments to aid in the fight. As a nation, we must make every effort to rid the world of these cartels and the cocaine from which they make their illicit living. The testimony we will hear today should shed some light on how we can best accomplish these goals. For these reasons, I, I look forward to today's testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Senator. Gentlemen, uh, we will uh, ask you to make brief statements, if you will, if you'd like, and begin with you, uh, Ambassador uh, Mascara. And uh, then uh, to you, uh, Ambassador Atala, and then to you, uh, Ambassador uh, Crespo, if we could, in, in, in that order. And then we will get to questions. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and distinguished senators, I wish to express my appreciation to Senator Biden for his interest in examining the very serious problem generated by drugs while seeking to provide solutions to a complex situation. This hearing is a timely forum to exchange views on the formulation of policies in the Andean nation as part of a general strategy against narcotics trafficking. The world has seen the Colombian government rise to its historic task by undertaking a relentless campaign against narco-trafficking. Drug lords and their accomplices have been apprehended. Their assets have been seized and will be used to further the war. Extraditions to other countries will continue in accordance with our law. Our people are aware of the threat that the drug barons pose not only to our institutions, but to Colombian society. Our only alternative is to continue to fight. 
the viciousness displayed by the traffickers in the retaliatory actions against the Colombian government has no parallel. In the bombing of a commercial airliner and the explosion of half a ton of dynamite outside the headquarters of the Colombian Bureau of, in of Investigation, 160 people were killed and over 500 were wounded. By spreading terror throughout the population, the drug cartels seek to pressure our society and thus erode public support for anti-drug measures. We cannot allow the dead merchants to succeed. I wish to draw your attention to the social and economic aspects of this war. As the violence escalates and the government takes strict security measures, increasing expenditures of law enforcement and the military, the level of activity in the Colombian economy is decreased. This, together with the sharp decline in coffee prices, has caused a significant economic downturn. If we are to attain stability by preserving the high growth rates of the past, we cannot let this become a permanent pattern. It seems obvious that inadequate degree of stability is fundamental in order for Colombia to continue the drug war. The incidence of factors of large magnitude, such as the war on drugs and the drop in coffee prices, is likely to be reflected in the deterioration of macroeconomic indicators. For 1990, the consolidated non-financial public sector deficit may rise beyond the accepted maximum of 2.5% of gross domestic product. At the same time, economic growth per capita can be expected to occur at barely positive rates. Here, I wish to stress the burden that the economic and social costs of the struggle have placed on Colombia. We have taken the front line in a war that should be the responsibility of all nations. Let me now turn to some specific proposals which we believe can be helpful for correcting the present economic situation. Trade issues. We have presented requests to obtain improved entry of Colombian goods into the U.S. market. A package of favorable measures that was recently announced for the Andean countries will have a positive impact in the long run, although its significance in the immediate future is at best limited. Expressions of goodwill and offers of cooperation notwithstanding we cannot help but feel dismay at actions such as the recent preliminary determination by the Department of Commerce concerning exports of some Colombian flowers to the United States. Using methodologies generally considered to be inappropriate, the measure imposes a retroactive surcharge on some flowers imported in the 1988 to 1989 period. The decision would cause serious damage to the $160 million market for Colombian flowers in the surcharge is imposed if the surcharge is imposed. The coffee agreement. For 27 years, the producer-consumer agreement maintained order in the world market and preserved adequate income levels for, for producing nations. The breakdown of the pact with the full support of the U.S. caused a severe fall in world price. As a result, Colombia stands to lose several hundred million dollars in 1989-1990. In spite of a change in attitude of the, on the part of the U.S., rebuilding the pact is proving to be is proving to be far more difficult than it was to bring it down. 
As long as world prices remain low, the Colombian economy will continue to incur heavy loss losses. External, external financing dividing plan. Although highly reputed as a good debtor, we have found difficulties in our attempts to obtain continued external financing. We are working to enlist the help of the United States in order to create a more favorable atmosphere within the international financial system. In spite of our efforts to responsibly handle our, our obligations, we cannot help filling the foreign debt burden, a key factor in Latin America's economic crisis of the 1980s. After two decades, decades of six percent average rates of real growth, Latin America became stagnant in the 80s with zero percent projected average rate of growth for 1989. This situation clearly justifies the statement made by the government of the World Bank for Brazil at the 1989 meeting of the boards of governors. He said, Quote, at the close of 1980s, Latin America is in a state of siege. End quote. The Biden proposal identifies the, limitation imposed, the, lim the limitations imposed by the debt burden on the Andean nations and addresses the connection between economic hardship and drug production. By reducing external debt in each of the countries, public domestic resources are free to be used in programs which will naturally stimulate people away from illicit crop production. This will lead to the integration of sectors of the population into the national economy and a reduced flow of illegal substances. Repatriation of international assets of drug traffickers. This involves the most elementary considerations of justice and fairness. By asking for the return to Colombia of a considerable portion of all assets seized from Colombian traffickers abroad, we are calling for a fair reallocation of resources of resources where they are most needed to continue the fight against drug traffickers. A special economic support program. As I have explained, economic prospects for the short run are not totally optimistic. With the goal of overcoming the obstacles before us, we are proposing that those industrialized countries that have a stake in the drug war join together to provide Colombia with a large-scale one-time financial assistance to $1 billion. This sum would go to mitigate the costs associated with the struggle, as well as the negative economic effects from the breakdown of the coffee pot. There are many possible ways to channel this assistance and a wide variety of socially beneficial uses. We will take this proposal to the various governments involved in the hope that it will be given careful consideration in keeping with the extraordinary circumstances that surround our present situation. Other anti-drug measures. Additionally, we would like to see measures to curtail the flow of arms, ammunition, and explosives, which are being used to kill our public officials, judges, and community leaders, restrictions on the unauthorized export of precursor chemicals essential for the production of illicit drugs, and harmful pollutants for our lands and rivers, the strictest application of money laundering legislation to seize the enormous profits generated by the trade, 
and is member of the global financial cartel. Ultimately, though, consuming countries must do their utmost to stamp out demand for drugs. Law enforcement and military measures have only a temporary character and cannot by themselves be a solution to what is essentially a social ill. In closing, I wish to reiterate my gratitude for your willingness to listen to our views. I now offer my undivided attention to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador, for a thorough opening statement and uh, for your uh, endorsement of the so-called Biden debt for drug proposal. Maybe we can make some other converts along the way. Uh, Ambassador Atala, welcome, and uh, please proceed. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, as it is known, I was recalled by my government as a protest for the American intervention Excuse in Panama. Excuse me for interrupting, Mr. Ambassador. This, the acoustics in this room are very bad, so you may have to pull that, uh, that whole apparatus up closer. Thank um, you. If you don't mind, it's very... I would not. Is this all right now? That, I think that's fine. You Thank have you. to speak directly into it, uh, otherwise it can't be heard in the room. Very Thank you very much. I will repeat. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry for the interruption. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, as it is known, I was recalled by my government as a protest for the American intervention in Panama. I am now back in Washington to participate in this hearing on the drug problem called by your committee. My presence here, Mr. Chairman, is meant to show our respect an appreciation for your efforts to help solve one of the most severe and difficult problems of our time, drug abuse and trafficking. And it is certainly meant as a courtesy to my distinguished colleagues and friends, the ambassadors of Colombia and Bolivia. Otherwise, the position of Peru in regard to the Panamian, Panamanian events remains unchanged. I would like to thank you, Mr. Chairman, as well as all the members of the Committee on the Judiciary and the Senate Caucus on International Narcotics Control for this opportunity to explain and discuss before the United States Senate the social and economic impact that the production of coca leaves and the illegal drug trafficking is causing to Peru. Today, Peru is no longer known around the world for its cultural heritage and accomplishments. But sadly, for being the largest coca producing country in the world. Our illegal coca production as a source of drug trafficking is a serious threat to the security of our democratic institutions. <coughs> Worse still, the unholy alliance between the drug traffickers and the Maoist and other terrorist bands in the upper Hualiaga Valley has become a real and deadly enemy working against the basic foundation of our foundations of our society. The powerful incentive of money, plenty of it, attracted thousands of Andean farmers into the coca producing Peruvian jungle with substantial detriment to agricultural production, especially food staples elsewhere in Peru. The mass of farmers and their families soon, be soon became caught in the nets of disparate bands with coinciding interests, the drug traffickers and the terrorists. Not to mention the continuous hostility of the Peruvian police in cooperation with the American DEA agents. The heavy financing of the terrorist activities by the drug dealers has gradually armed and equipped the terrorists with the most modern and lethal instruments of destruction. Destruction of innocent lives, now counted in the thousands, and destruction 
of extremely valuable public property such as energy generating plants and transmission lines, railroads and highways, as well as private property wherever they can accomplish an attack. These are, Mr. Chairman, examples of some of the social and economic devastation caused by drug abuse and trafficking in Peru. Peru has undertaken every possible action to fight this scourge, despite its acute economic and financial crisis. But the scourge keeps on. Hence, the activities of unlawful organization and their impact on the worsening economic, political, and social situation should be subject of an analysis leading to a readjustment of future policies and strategies. The external debt services, the growing fiscal deficit, and the negative trade balance, aggravated by its high dependency on a few export items at declining prices in the international market, complicate the already serious problems facing our government. Some of the most important indicators that we could use to analyze the social impact of drug abuse and trafficking perhaps are among the following. Money laundering by way of contraband, financial speculations, real estate deals, acquisition of legal established businesses subsequently used for money laundering via service-oriented enterprises like travel agencies, tourism-related businesses, etc. The circulation of ill-gotten foreign currency generates an internal economic dynamism where the conversion of this currency leads to swift monetary circulation, pushing prices into an inflationary spiral very, very difficult to control. An important, <clears throat> an important sector of the economy that is affected by drug trafficking is also agriculture. In some of the coca producing areas, there is a semblance of relative prosperity by comparison to other rural non-coca producing areas. But in fact, this appearance actually creates in the long run greater poverty and a decline in overall agricultural production. The coca leaf growing farmers work on conditions totally unfavorable to the techniques of soil conservation with sound agricultural planning. They just rape the land. Proposals for a solution. The results achieved by repressive action alone are self-defeating. This situation should lead to a serious review of the problem and its possible solutions, both in the consuming as well as in the produ producing nation. In the case of the latter, it has become evident that whatever the course and evolution of the demand side, the necessary action should not be exclusively repressive. It could be far more effective, we think, the creation of better conditions and opportunities for economic development in the coca producing areas. It is also important to adopt measures to stimulate commercial trade of products other than coca and to apply strategies that will open markets in the consuming nations via existing preferential tariff systems and or by creating other complementary trading mechanisms. For instance, it could be interesting to explore the possibilities of application in the Andean countries of the trade benefits contemplated under the Caribbean Basic Initiative, CBI. Proposal for a debt swap in exchange for efforts in the anti-drug program. This is, we consider with great interest the proposal made by Senator Joseph Biden, chairman of this committee, for a foreign debt conversion plan through a cooperative anti-drug program. Not only does it offer a coherent anti-drug strategy, but it may also become a significant aid for the international management of the foreign debt problem. 
to accept the possibility of condoning part of the external debt of those countries with mo moderate revenues. As outlined in some measures of the Brady Plan, it's a step forward, hopefully leading to the application of the condoning plan to the government-to-government -government debt. This would benefit our country, as some 48% of our debt involves non-commercial creditors, of which the United States is the principal recipient. Legal purchase of coca production. Now let me repeat here before this committee that it is time for us to search for innovative and bold initiatives to solve the problems of production, drug abuse, and trafficking. It could be important to bring to the United States authorities' attention the possibility of legal purchase of the annual production of coca leaves and its immediate destruction as the first step toward crop substitution and toward the establishment of an agro-industrial infrastructure to encourage higher value-added prices for many items that can be produced in the upper Wadiaga region. This agro-industrial infrastructure could and should be financed by joint, joint private investments in a constructive association of capitals and technologies of the industrialized nations and Peruvian entrepreneurs and farmers. To this end, I am confident the present, the present government, and according to the opinion of the leading presidential candidates participating in our next April election, <coughs> the next government, whatever it is final makeup, will bring its full support to the social and economic development of our Guayaga region on the basis of joint private investment duly guaranteed and protected. Furthermore, the proposal entails not merely substitution of one crop for another, but rather one economy for another one socio-economic system based on unlawful practices and corruption for a productive, legal, and constructive system of which we all could feel proud in the not-too-distant future. The present total production of illegal coca leaves in the upper Vallaga Valley amounts approximately to about 180,000 tons, metric tons, the cost of purchase in this production and its subsequent destruction could probably be a fraction, a small fraction, of what is now spent in the interdiction, eradication, and prevention efforts of the anti-drought program. It is worth mentioning the initia this initiative taken by farmers is one of the most troubled, in one of the most troubled coca-producing regions in Peru, that is the upper Guayaga Valley, where a long-term agro-industrial agro program is being enthusiastically proposed by the farmers themselves as a substitute to the illegal coca production. I think this formula would hit on the central nerves of the drug traffickers' illegal enterprise. It could mean the destruction of the raw material which makes cocaine available in the United States streets, schools, and homes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, and uh, now a uh, distinguished new ambassador from Bolivia, Ambassador Crespo. Welcome. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, distinguished senators, I have accepted the invitation of Senator Joseph Biden, chairman of the Committee on the Judiciary, to appear before this hearing to show my support for his initiative and in the hopes that the information I can provide will serve to complement and enhance his well thought out proposal to exchange debt for drug eradication efforts. In the statement submitted to your office the day before yesterday, Mr. Chairman, I have tried to respond to your queries, mentioning the following aspects. First, that my two predecessors appeared in previous Senate hearings. On both occasions, 
the Bolivian ambassadors gave testimony of action taken by the government of my country to curtail the production of the coca leaf through eradication and crop substitution, as well as the interdiction efforts made to destroy laboratories and punish narco-traffic. As a matter of fact, I would like to mention at this moment that uh, today in Bolivia, they're going to carry out the burning, the incineration of one ton of cocaine. And this is the second ton that is being burned in the last two months. The action is being taken at this very moment in the Chapari Valley. It was also made clear that, that alternative economic development is essential for us as a means to substitute the production of the coca leaf. Second, let me summarize what has been done on the economic front in Bolivia. Bolivia has successfully stabilized its economy, bringing down inflation from 25,000% a year in 1985 to 16.5% four years later. Bolivia has reduced the public sector deficit from 25% of the gross national product to 5%. Bolivia has negotiated deep, deep debt reduction with commercial banks before the existence of the Brady Plan, wiping out a substantial part of our external debt. And last but not least, Bolivia has brought about a true, solid, and hopefully long-lasting democratic process. Third, let me give you some indication of how the coca-cocaine economy is enmeshed in our overall economy. Let me stress the fact that the value added generated by the coca cocaine circuit has been estimated at almost $1.6 billion. More than 60% of this total income goes to traffickers. Hence, it is difficult to know how much of this amount remains in the country. The remainder, nearly $600 million is kept by the peasant farmers who cultivate coca leaves and produce base paste. The end result is that the coca cocaine economy has a direct impact on certain variables, such as employment, income, exports, and foreign exchange reserves. To supplant this economy and mitigate the terrible social costs financial cooperation is imperative. New and fresh investments are needed to enhance our ag agricultural development in order to bring the peasants who have gone into coca cultivation back to their places of origin, to reduce our food imports and to increase non-traditional exports. The mining sector, particularly the one that includes gold, silver, lithium, platinum, and others could benefit from concessional financing or foreign investment. In order to mitigate the immediate social cost of the substitution of the coca economy, we plan to create a temporary social compensatory fund where options for temporary employment could be available for the population directly affected. Roads and infrastructure construction could be the activity selected by this fund. In this sense, and after listening to Ambassador Atala from Peru, I would like to endorse the Peruvian initiative in the sense of selling our coca leaf production during the years alternative development is getting underway to mitigate the social cost. All in all, Additional financing from internal sources as well as from international cooperation is badly needed to implement our objective of alternative development. A reduction of our external debt payments would give us, would, would give us much needed cash flow relief to finance the programs mentioned. Although our external debt situation is better than in most Latin American countries, as I mentioned in my statement, we can certainly benefit from your initiative, Mr. Chairman, to exchange debt payments for practical programs to curtail coca production. 
Our 1990 obligation on the foreign debt amounts to $240 million for principal and $160 million for interest, 50% of which is comprised of our obligation on government-to-government -government debts. If this amount could be diverted to support our efforts to substitute the coca cocaine economy, we would, we would more than double the resources offered by this purpose by the U.S. government for 1990, including President Bush's and the plan. In finishing this opening statement, let me assure you, Mr. Chairman, that my government and President Passamora personally is willing to make all the necessary efforts to substitute the coca cocaine economy for a coherent and long-lasting development. We do not want to become poorer by fighting the production of coca leaves. We want to develop and offer alternative lawful activities to our peasants. If the international community joins us in this endeavor, we will be successful and the scourge of drug trafficking will no longer plague us. Your initiative, Senator Biden, is welcomed. I also would like to take advantage of Senator Kennedy's suggestion that we should give some advice, as he said, to the executive and legislative body on how to improve our efforts to fight this scourge. Let me uh, give two pieces of advice in this sense. First of all, I would advise both branches of government, legislative and executive, to approve Senator Biden's proposal. And secondly, I would also ask you to understand and respect our view of the problem. And for this, permit me to read the paragraph which explains this. President Passamora was very clear at the United Nations Assembly last September when he said that the illicit traffic of drugs is an international problem. He said that the war on drugs must be waged in each and every one of the countries affected with the tools and resources tailored to each nation's specific needs. In the consuming net countries, he said, prevention, education, and punishment is fundamental. In the areas where trafficking is the problem, interdiction and repression are essential. And in the countries where the raw material is grown, alternative development is imperative. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, and I'm obviously uh, I'm flattered by your support of the proposal that I've, that I've put forward. And uh, hopefully we can continue to work together and, as I said, maybe reach some uh, overall agreement among our countries. Uh, I have no particular pride of authorship in it, uh, it's, uh, and it can be improved, and you've already, three of you helped me uh, attempt to improve that, and, and possibly uh, the administration may find interest in it as well. Senator Kennedy has a, uh, um, we were, first of all, let me begin by saying, we'll go in the first round by a 10-minute rule, if my colleagues would agree to that. Uh, I'm going to ask to just take two minutes of that 10, and with the permission of my colleagues, yield the rest to Senator Kennedy because he has an important engagement he must uh, attend downtown. One other prefatory statement, uh, I said $700 billion was the loss uh, to the coffee as a consequence of the failure of the coffee, the breakdown of the coffee agreement. I meant to say $700 million. Obviously, I've been in Washington too long um, because that's the proper number, $700 million. And, uh, I want to point out that, Ambassador Tella, your comment about purchasing the raw material, the entire coca crop, is one that I, quite frankly, think we should consider more seriously. I would point out, from a historical perspective, we essentially did that in the one serious, successful effort under the Nixon administration to eradicate coca, I mean, excuse me, uh, opium, uh, poppy, in Turkey. That wasn't the totality of the program, but it played a significant part in that, and I although I have not firm, formed a final opinion on it, at least as a first step in order to allow things to get underway, uh, it is something I think should be seriously considered and I'm anxious to uh, learn more about that proposal. I'd like to direct now my, my question, one question I have before I yield to Senator Kennedy 
And that's to you, uh, Ambassador Mascara. Um, and I'd like to ask you uh, very briefly, yesterday the leaders of the Medellin cartel, speaking under the name of the extraditables, uh, offered to end their drug operation ex in exchange for pardon and promises uh, of no extradition to the United States. At least that's how I assume that statement was met when they said legalities. I, um, Ambassador, I know your government has yet to issue an official, at least my understanding is, you've yet to issue an official response to this offer, but I'd like to ask you three very brief questions. First, in their statement, the extraditables, as they call themselves, said that Colombia had, quote, won its war against them. While great strides actually have been made by your government, do you believe that the war has been won yet? Comprendo, I, I, I will speak in Spanish with the help of my secretary. Uh, he will, uh, will translate Certainly. my answer. Comprendo el interés que ha suscitado la declaración hecha por los narcotraficantes de Colombia que se llaman a sí mismos los extraditables. I understand the interest that the uh, declaration of the so-called extraditables has generated in the United States. Para precisar la respuesta, mi respuesta a su pregunta, Tengo que referirme a un antecedente. Ese antecedente es el de que hace unos pocos días un grupo de eminentes colombianos encabezados por el Cardenal Arzobispo de Colombia, por tres expresidentes de ambos partidos tradicionales, el liberal y el conservador, y por el secretario del Partido Comunista Colombiano, hicieron una declaración en el sentido de exhortar a los narcotraficantes que tenían colombianos secuestrados para que los liberaran a la mayor brevedad. Se abstuvieran de seguir cometiendo actos terroristas y prescindieran de la exportación de coca al exterior. In order to give you a precise answer to your question, I would like to refer to a precedent. Um, in the, the past week, a number, a group of Colombian notables, including the Cardinal of the Catholic Church, several former presidents from both the Liberal and the Conservative Party, and the head of the uh, Patriotic Union, the leftist uh, political party of Colombia, made a declaration to the extraditables. In that declaration, they made an exhortation to the extraditables to, number one, free all the hostages that they have taken, number two, to stop all violent actions, and number three, to stop the exportation of cocaine. En esa misma exhortación hecha por los personajes a que me he referido, se agregaba que en el caso de que los narcotraficantes procedieran en la forma pedida, probablemente recibirían un trato menos riguroso de la sociedad colombiana. In that same exhortation, uh, this group of people indicated that if the extraditables were to follow uh, the exhortations, they might be receiving uh, especially lenient treatment. Naturalmente, En esta exhortación no tuvo nada que ver el gobierno de Colombia y hasta donde llegan mis informaciones no fue consultado. 
naturally in this exhortation uh, the Colombian government had nothing to do and as far as my information goes it was not consulted la respuesta de los extraditables no se hizo esperar ellos liberaron a unas distinguidas damas de la sociedad de Medellín que tenían secuestradas y con ellas enviaron el comunicado que ha sido ampliamente publicado por la prensa. The reply from the extraditables was not long in coming. Uh, they sent the reply with uh, two distinguished ladies from the Medellín Society who were freed um, and that communique has been widely publicized. En ese comunicado, ellos se comprometen en primer término a liberar a todos los secuestrados, advirtiendo que no todas las personas que están secuestradas en Colombia lo han sido por los narcotraficantes. En su comunicado, los extraditables agree to uh, free the people who have take, been taken hostage and they indicate that not all of the hostages are have been taken by them también se comprometen a suspender totalmente la exportación de cocaína al exterior They also agree to stop all exports of cocaine abroad. Y se comprometen a intervenir con otros grupos armados dependientes de ellos para que entreguen conjuntamente las armas al gobierno de Colombia. And they also pledge to work with several armed groups with which they have been working in order to have their arms be turned over to the Colombian government. Reconocen que el gobierno ha ganado la batalla contra ellos. They recognize the fact that the Colombian government has won the battle against them. El gobierno de Colombia ha dicho reiteradamente y lo ha repetido ahora que él no hará transacciones con la ley, que no aplicará la ley de indulto a los narcotraficantes y que si ellos deciden hacer lo que han prometido, el gobierno tendría que someter esos hechos a una rigurosa verificación. The government has indicated that it will not negotiate with the traffickers and that even if they are to turn themselves over, that uh, they would be brought to justice. Yo creo para contestar más concretamente su pregunta que si bien no puede afirmarse todavía que el gobierno ha ganado la guerra contra el narcotráfico y creo que la tiene casi totalmente ganada. To answer specifically to your question, even though I don't think that the war has been won yet, I think that the Colombian government is very close to obtaining a total victory. De otra manera no se explicaría esta nueva actitud de los extraditables contraria a sus procedimientos anteriores. Otherwise, this change in the attitude of the extraditables uh, would be very hard to explain since it's very different from their past actions. Naturalmente, yo creo en dos viejos refranes de nuestra filosofía popular. Del dicho al hecho hay mucho trecho. Y segundo, obras son amores y no buenas razones. 
but I do believe in the uh, in two wise old proverbs of our popular folklore. One says that from words to actions, there's a long way to go. And another one says that actions mean love, good words do not. We also have an expression in our country, and as a student in grade school, and uh, the press knows well of my academic prowess. Uh, as a student in grade school, we, when we misbehaved, and I would let the record show, I often misbehaved, we would be required to go to the blackboard after school in what we called detention in the Catholic grade school I attended and write various sayings 50 or 100 or 150 times as punishment. And one of them was, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And this is my last question for you. It relates to that. It seems as though notwithstanding the good intention of the administration, and I believe they are good intentions, to deal with aiding both Colombia and uh, all the Andean nations, as well as ourselves, by stationing U.S. naval forces in international waters off of uh, the coast of your country. There have been press accounts that that good intention was never adequately communicated to your government so that you were fully apprised of what was intended. And I have two questions for you from that. One, is that correct? Were you caught, as we say, unaware? Were you, were you surprised by the action? Or had you had a lot of consultation with the Defense and State Department ahead of time and then rejected the action? That is my first question. My second, my second question is, notwithstanding that, with, with prior consultation and joint control by Colombian and U.S. forces, are cooperative military operations between Colombia and the United States still possible. So my first question is, were you fully consulted about the prospect of placing U.S. Naval Task Force off your country's border? And my second question is, whether you were or you weren't, if we have adequate prior consultation and joint control by Colombia and the United States, our future cooperative military actions possible between our countries. En cuanto a la primera parte de su cuestionario, tengo que contestarle que de acuerdo con las informaciones que yo tengo, en realidad de verdad no hubo unas consultas formales con el gobierno de Colombia para el despacho de los barcos hacia aguas internacionales en frente de las costas colombianas. Pero además, quiero decirle también que hubo varias declaraciones de diferentes funcionarios de la administración americana que confundieron un tanto los propósitos de la operación naval. Unas declaraciones del Pentágono, otras de los consejeros del presidente Bush, otras de la Secretaría de Estado, 
y a veces en esas declaraciones usaron términos que en el idioma inglés no tienen un significado igual o por lo menos equivalente en nuestro idioma. Eso facilitó el que se hubiera hecho por la prensa colombiana una interpretación probablemente contraria a las verdaderas intenciones del gobierno americano. With regard to the first part of your question, I would like to say that as far as my, as my information goes, there were no formal consultations with my government. But I would like to add that uh, prior to the supposed uh, deployment of the vessels, there were a lot of declarations regarding that action on the part of uh, various officials from the American administration, some by Pentagon officials, some by advisors uh, to the White House, and some by people um, in the State Department. The declarations were somewhat conflicting. Uh, they added uh, confusion to the situation. And uh, something very important is that I think they made use of certain specific terms which in English do not have the same meaning as, or equivalence as they do in Spanish. And that may be the reason why the Colombian press made a big deal out of the situation and uh, may have done so contrary to what may have been the true intentions of the U.S. administration. That's what I meant about the road to hell. Um, uh, I understand phrases like blockade were used and they connote something very different than what was intended, as I understand it, well intended in my view, uh, and, uh, not, uh, and not out of line, I might add, in my view, uh, by the administration. Well, I, my time is up and I'll come back to this, Mr. Ambassador, but it is my hope that uh, now that that uh, unfortunate lack of communication which took place has, is behind us and the administration has, in my view, to their credit, wisely responded and pulled back from that operation, uh, that we would be able to, in the upcoming months, um, have more detailed and thorough discussions about the utility of any such action in the future because I believe, and I must go on record as saying this, I criticize the administration enough and I should state out front where I agree with them, I believe the concept and the notion, one which I have been arguing for for over two years, is, is not misplaced if done properly. But I will come back to that. I am uh, keeping my colleagues too long here. I yield to my, uh, my friend from South Carolina uh, for this first round of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ambassador Marcia. Uh, Columbia Salem deserves recognition for the steps it has taken in recent months to eliminate the drug cartels which have terrorized its citizens for so many years. As the cartels begin to lose their strength, how do you see Colombia improving its economy? En realidad de verdad, contrariamente a lo que se ha pensado por muchas personas, nosotros no dependemos de la economía de la droga. La droga no nos ha traído ningún beneficio, nos ha traído muchos perjuicios económicos y financieros, inclusive problemas fiscales de gran magnitud, porque hemos tenido que destinar 
recursos del presupuesto nacional destinados a fines productivos de carácter económico y social para dedicarlos a la lucha contra el narcotráfico. En la medida en que el narcotráfico se extinga en Colombia, nuestra economía será más próspera. Contrary to what many people may think, the Colombian economy is not dependent on a drug economy for survival. It's quite the opposite. Uh, the drug trade has had very negative effects on the Colombian economy on various aspects, including uh, fiscal management. The Colombian government has had to transfer resources from investment um, from economically productive areas, social expenditures, to law enforcement and military operations to combat the drug cartels. Insofar as the drug cartels are beginning to lose power, the economic situation will improve. Mr. Ambassador, in August, President Bush announced that the United States would be sending a $65 million aid package to Colombia. Would you discuss what impact this aid has had upon Colombia's efforts to rid itself of the cartels? Realmente, la ayuda de los 65 millones no fue en dinero efectivo, sino en armas usadas para luchar contra el narcotráfico. Y según las informaciones que yo he dado, esas armas que enviaron estimadas en 65 millones de dólares no han sido las más apropiadas para luchar contra el narcotráfico. Han sido armas que pueden utilizarse en una guerra convencional, pero no en una guerra de las características que tiene la lucha contra el narcotráfico. Pero, de todas maneras, esos 65 millones tuvieron para los Estados Unidos una notoria compensación con el decomiso de depósitos que pertenecían a un narcotraficante colombiano que fue muerto por las autoridades de policía de mi país, el señor Rodríguez Gacha, alias el mexicano, a quien se le decomisaron por el gobierno americano depósitos en bancos extranjeros, principalmente europeos, por una cantidad más o menos igual al valor de las armas enviadas a Colombia. The 65 million dollar aid package that was sent down to Colombia was not a cash um, aid package. It consisted mostly of used arms to combat narcotics traffickers. Most of those arms would be very useful in a conventional type of warfare, but they are not very useful in the special type of operations that are required to fight narcotics traffickers. Furthermore, the expenditures incurred uh, by the United States in the sending of that $65 million aid package have been adequately compensated by the seizure of the assets held by the Colombian trafficker who was killed by Colombian authorities, Mr. Rodriguez Gacha, the Mexican of his alias, uh, assets that he held in foreign banks. Mr. Ambassador, would you discuss what effect debt forgiveness would actually have on your economy? In addition, do you foresee your government or other governments taking steps to have commercial debt forgiven?
La deuda colombiana en la actualidad vale 16.600 millones de dólares aproximadamente, de los cuales 14.500 aproximadamente corresponden a una deuda a largo y mediano plazo y el resto a deuda a corto plazo. Colombia ha venido cumpliendo puntualmente sus compromisos con todos los bancos y países acreedores. No hemos tenido hasta ahora necesidad de pedir la refinanciación de la deuda, pero naturalmente en lo que se refiere al plan Biden concretamente, nos interesa no exactamente por lo que se refiere a nosotros los colombianos, sino por lo que puede significar para la erradicación de la materia prima de las hojas de coca producidas en nuestros países vecinos y que son las que sirven para refinar la cocaína en los laboratorios de Colombia. Colombian foreign debt um, amounts to a total of roughly 16.6 billion dollars, out of which um, about 14.5 billion is uh, medium term debt and the rest is short term debt. Up to this point, Colombia has kept up its payments both in bilateral debt and commercial debt and has avoided to either refinance or restructure its obligations. With regards to debt reduction as is contemplated in the Biden proposal, we are not so much interested in the direct impact that that proposal might have on the Colombian economy but we are very interested in the effects that it may have on the neighboring countries for the eradication of crops, which are the main substances used for the transformation and production of cocaine in our own country. Uh, Now to the distinguished ambassador from Peru. Mr. Ambassador, the cocaine industry has inflicted suffering upon millions of people across the world. To what extent has your country faced the scourge of drug abuse? Uh, <coughs> Senator, <coughs> even though Peru is, as we all know, the largest coca leaf producing country, we have never had the problem of cocaine addiction. The Peruvian inhabitants chew the coca leaves for centuries, but they don't do it to get a high. They, get, they use the coca leaves as a supplement to their nutrition. Coca leaves produce in them a, a caloric supplement which they need to work at altitudes of 13, 14, and even 16,000 feet above the sea level. This is not and should not be understood as an apology for the Indians to chew coca because medical studies have demonstrated that coca chewing, even chewing, is bad is detrimental to the health of the people in the long run. But for as long as we are unable to provide them with the food that they need, it's very difficult to eradicate in them the habit of chewing coca. As for cocaine using, I repeat, this is a new phenomenon in our country. The potential, the negative, the dangerous potential of which cannot be exaggerated. Youngsters are starting to use it, and it's almost impossible 
to avoid the spread of this scourge and the depressing conditions in which we have to live. Mr. Ambassador, as our nations continue to work together to rid the world of cocaine traffickers, what do you see as the most troubling problem facing Peru as a result of the cocoa cocaine industry and how do you believe the United States can best assist your country in its efforts to remedy the situation? Uh, Senator Thurman, I think that uh, the worst damage that the cocaine trafficking is doing to my country in the immediate political aspect of it, regardless of the social consequences of the medical problems related to the cocaine abuse, is that the drug traffickers are providing heavy financing to the Mano Maoist terrorists in my country, which has you know, just by reading the papers, it's destroying, trying to destroy the very fabric of our society. And this is not a, a, a rhetoric expression. They are destroying, destroying our railroads, our electrical generating plants, our roads, our crops, the delight of our people, and thousands of them. So, in a very direct and, the direct and immediate result of the cocaine tra trade is that they have made it possible for the terrorists to continue in their cr criminal act. In other words, without the drug trafficking financing, it's very likely that the government of Peru would have solved this problem long ago. Mr. Ambassador, President Bush has instituted an Andean strategy in which Peru has taken part. As negotiations continue to evolve regarding implementation of the Andean strategy, what have become the issues most difficult to resolve? I think that uh, one of the, I wouldn't say the most difficult issues, I think that uh, if the United States authorities would give some serious attention to what we have been saying all along. Among other things, this uh, initiative of buying the, the, the coca leaves and destroying them. I think we could find ways of cooperating in a real way to find lasting solutions, not only for the drug trafficking, because, as you know, Senator Thurman, even this evil, terrible evil, have in a way certain silver lining. Perhaps this will give an opportunity in which we can get closer together in facing problems where appearing to be Peruvian problems actually are problems which affect every na nation in the world, especially every nation in this continent. Now, distinguished Ambassador of Bolivia, in your prepared statement, you state that approximately 20% of the economically active population in Bolivia is involved in cocoa cocaine processing. The cocaine industry contributes 22.6%, more than one-fifth, to your GNP. These figures are truly alarming. Briefly, would you discuss whether Bolivia has been able to offer those engaged in the drug trade any economic options? Yes, Mr. Senator. Unfortunately, up to now, uh, we haven't been able to offer them much because of the lack of resources. That's why we make a plea to the international community to help us in developing uh, alternative activities for these people. Uh, we are asking not only the United States, but also the international community to help us on this. And uh, several measures have been enacted already by the government to motivate and incentivate foreign investments in the country. Because we are certain that foreign investments will develop our country in the agricultural side as well as in the mining sectors. And those two sectors could absorb a lot of peasants that at this moment 
uh, have as their principal activity the coca leaf production and the cocaine production. And that's the way we are trying to address th this problem. Mr. Ambassador, in your prepared statement, you propose that Bolivia be relieved of the $457 million it owes to the United States so that the money may be used to provide individuals who are currently involved in cocoa cocaine production with financial assistance while the economy develops. In your opinion, is this, uh, is this nothing more than paying Bolivians not to break the law as you see it? Or in your opinion, could the money be more effectively spent to destroy current crops and arrest cocaine traffickers? Well, uh, we believe that, uh, and that's our proposal, that the, these monies could be used to met mitigate the social impact of uh, bringing those people outside of that activity. Uh, we don't think really that uh, only eradication is the solution. Uh, we've had uh, some experiences in the last years. There have been programs uh, between the United States and the Bolivian government to eradicate uh, cultivation of coca leaves, but unfortunately the results have not been as, su as successful as, as we wanted to, do, to be. As a matter of fact, during last year, 1989, although quite a bit of money was put into this eradication program, uh, the um, amount of hectares of coca cultivations has increased by 20% even though this program of eradication was underway. So we don't think that is the solution. We have to look for alternative development more than eradication. I just have one more question. Uh, would you discuss briefly whether you believe debt forgiveness for Bolivia would result in similar requests from other data nations? Well, we think uh, that the United States could take the lead for, with this initiative, if we are relieved of our of the payments of our government to government debt, I'm pretty sure that many industrialized countries will follow suit um, because they are also interested in our economic development in order to eradicate the coca cocaine economy. I believe uh, the debt owed by Bolivia is 457 million. Is that correct? Pardon me. We? The debt owed to the United States by Bolivia is 457 million. It's 418 exactly. 418 is your figure? Right. Now Peru, uh, the debt owed by Peru is, the figure I had was $701 million. Is that correct? That's right, sir. In Colombia, $1.142 billion. Is that correct? Okay. One point one four two billion. Como? Es correcto en cuanto se refiere a la deuda bilateral, no la multilateral. That is correct. Uh, insofar as it includes uh, bilateral debt, not multilateral debt. I believe these figures do not include commercial debt in any of the countries I mentioned. Uh, I have no more questions. I want to thank you, distinguished ambassadors, for coming. I'm glad we have good relations with your nations. We want to continue to work with you. We feel that uh, the United States should be more interested uh, in the countries in this continent than any part of the world. And in any way we can contribute and, and exchange uh, trade and deal with you in various ways, I think it's well for our country as well as yours to do so. And I think we can continue to work together to eliminate the cocaine industry that exists in this whole hemisphere. It's to advantage of your people as well as ours. Drugs can destroy, uh, can destroy this nation. It can destroy your nation. 
and we appreciate your interest in coming here. We appreciate your interest in trying to eliminate uh, the cocaine industry and other drugs. Thank you very much for your parents. Thank you, Senator. Gentlemen, let me, before I begin, some more questions here, if you're willing to sit a little longer. Yes, I understand, yes. Um, would you all like a cup of coffee? <laughs> no, I'm being serious uh, when I say that. Would you like something to, That's would you like? Columbia coffee. coffee. <laughs> well, I will not, I, I will let you all, I'm sure you can all determine where, by the taste of the coffee, where it comes from. We'll get one cup of Bolivian, one cup of Peruvian, one cup of Colombian coffee, and we'll uh, see to it, you, and I'll let, let you all pick which it is. With that, let me, uh, let me uh, uh, begin my, my question here. And because Senator Hatch, unfortunately, had to leave, I, that's why, uh, it's not that we don't know when 10 minutes is up, but uh, I, rather than interrupt Senator Thurman, uh, decided to let him ask all the questions because he too, has, a, has an engagement, but unfortunately for all of you, I have no engagement, you are my engagement, and uh, I'd like to continue, if I may, for a, a few moments longer. Ambassador, your proposal of purchasing, legally purchasing uh, coca crop, I understand, let me ask you if I understand it properly. You are not proposing that a policy be established that from this point on, all coca crops will be purchased ad infinitum. You are proposing that that be done in the short term to allow you through other mechanisms, whether it's the Biden debt for drug swap, individual initiatives in your own country, to be able in the interim, move in and establish not merely crop substitution, but potentially light industry or other al other economic alternatives for the farmers. Is that correct? Correct, sir. Now, the second question I have is, and you may not have this information, do you have any estimate of what the cost would be to legally purchase all of the coca crop in your country in one fell swoop? Do you have any notion what the cost would be? Yes, sir. Uh, before answering your question, I have some figures which I'll give to you now. Uh, let me make a brief comment on uh, why we think that this would be a very good idea, especially from the point of view of the cooperation of the farmers. Uh, we believe the cooperation that of the farmers? Of the farmers. We believe that without their cooperation, without bringing them to the side of the law, our campaign against drug trafficking will be far more difficult. Uh, actually, the present system, the present programs as enacted in, in the Peruvian jungle have converted the farmers into unwilling accomplices of the traffickers because they get the source of their income, of their livelihood, out of selling them coca leaves to the traffickers. So, they do this unwillingly because as farmers all over the world, they would prefer to live within the law, but they are not allowed to. Let me interrupt you there for a yes. minute. I was startled to learn that the farmers in your country, as well as in Bolivia, and to a much less extent in Colombia, they actually don't make very much money growing a coca leaf. That a farmer, the average coca grower farmer in your country, and I may be mistaken here, does not make much more than $1,000 a year. Absolutely right, Senator Biden. And I am very happy that you have uh, observed this because if you read the press, there's some uh, lightly written reports which uh, tend to make you believe that Peru leaves on the coca business and that uh, this is the main source of our income and that we love to have this kind of income. That's absolutely not so. Uh, I am going to give you some figures. The estimate production of coca leaves in the Upper Wollaga Valley, which is the main production the main, area, the, the, the biggest country. in yeah. the whole world, is about 180,000 metric tons. 
the illegal production of coca leaves. Uh, out of this, the price that the uh, farmers get for this, taking the average of the price of coca leaves in the last five years, which fluctuated from $600 per metric ton to $2,000 per metric ton. This makes, if you multiply the average of 1,300 US dollars per metric ton by 180,000, you will have a total of 234 million US dollars per year, per year. Actually, I think it's a very, very important point that be made because many people, well intended again, assume that the farmers are being rewarded financially in the same way that those who convert the coca leaf into coca, into cocaine as we know it in this country, and or distribute it. And we see on television repeatedly, both in fact and fiction, the vast rewards that are reaped by those folks with mansions and automobiles and airplanes and diamonds, et cetera, that it's a very different story for the farmer. Absolutely. The farmers get a price for their coca leaves, which is not terribly higher than they would get with other products. It is a, a difference. It, it is, is slightly higher, though. But not uh, the price you would suppose they get when you know about the cocaine prices that's paid in Europe or the United States. There's an abysmal difference in this respect. Now, you will read uh, sometimes that uh, they say that the Peruvian economy has, has become so dependent that 800 million, one, uh, even one billion dollars, US dollars get because of the, uh, of the traffic. Uh, obviously, it's very difficult to make a clear estimate. But I think that what you can be sure is getting into the hands of the farmers, this 234 million, and the real money that enters into the Peruvian economy. The rest is what the value-added operators get, the traffickers and their accomplices, those who buy the automobiles and the BCRs and, the, uh, and all the uh, uh, external signs of affluence, not the farmers. So the farmers, which on the other hand are attacked continually by the police, by the terrorists, and under the pressure of the traffickers themselves, would dream to be on the side of the law without all of them. And I assume that, as I understand it, again, correct me if I'm wrong, and Ambassador Crespo, I, I don't know whether the figures I'm about to cite are the same in Bolivia, but if you would stay with me for a moment to determine whether the principle I'm about to lay out is the same. My understanding is that with when the coffee agreement, speaking of coffee, here comes some coffee, when the coffee agreement was in place, farmers in Bolivia and Peru could make slightly more money growing coca leaves. But now that the coffee prices have almost been cut in half, if I understand it correctly in your country, that the disparity between what a farmer can make this year growing a crop of coca as opposed to growing a coffee crop is much wider. And that is an additional incentive pushing farmers into or forcing them to stay in the cultivation of coca. Is that correct or incorrect? That is correct, Mr. Senator. Uh, furthermore, what happened in Bolivia last year, of the last couple of years, there was a substitution crop program uh, held by the UNFDAC of the United Nations, whereas many uh, coca-growing peasants were um, motivated to go into the coffee growing. And so they did go, and when they had the crops ready to export them, the price went down. So those people went back to the coca production. So 
So what you said is very true. Now, I, I'm aware that Colombia by far is that, that coffee production in both your countries is not the mainstay of your economies by any stretch of the imagination, but it is a significant element of the Colombian economy. My question, Mr. Ambassador, is this. Has, have you seen any evidence of coffee producing farmers moving away from the production of coffee with the depressed prices and into coca production? I realize it's a very short time frame. And again, I know that Colombia is not a primary producer of the raw material of the coca leaf. But are you seeing any movement in that direction, or do you have any concern that if coffee prices do not rise, that they would turn to coca production? Todavía no hemos tenido esa manifestación. We still have not had, have not seen any manifestations of that. Now, let me uh, go back and explore with you, all three of you, for a moment, the proposal that I have put forward, so-called uh, debt for drug swap. And uh, all three of you, in to varying degrees, have either uh, fully endorsed and or have been sympathetic to the proposal. Now, the total Andean, U.S., the United States Andean aid plan to this point has been about three-tenths of a billion dollars, about 281, um, excuse me, a million dollars. I keep saying billion, million dollars. And the proposal the president has put forward for five years is about two billion dollars for five years. Now the reason why I came up with this plan, my motivation, quite frankly, initially, was that it seems that the United States is faced with the requirement in its own interest, as well as out of fairness, in sharing the burden of dealing with this scourge of drugs, to aid the Indian country. But if we continue the old proposal, the old way, we are going to be required on a yearly basis, the United States, year in and year out, to appropriate additional monies with no end in sight, as far as I can see it. Whereas if we move to a drug for debt swap, we have the potential to not be required to ask the American taxpayer year in and year out for what are increasingly sizable amounts of money. And as you've observed in our press recently, foreign aid is becoming increasingly less popular regardless of whether or not it is in our self-interest. And so the notion of the debt for drug swap in some cases the principal on outstanding debt that is at a very high rate of interest because of when it was occurred. And that if you did not have to pay, come up with that hard currency, you would have even more money in terms of your own currencies to reinvest in those rural communities to provide alternatives, or at least attempt to. And theoretically, it would not require yearly appropriations by the United States Treasury to meet our obligation to help, and quite frankly, would benefit you even more. And envisioned in this approach, when I approached your government some months ago, was not merely for the United States to be the only participant in this process, but for the United States to get the G7 to also 
engage in this process. Most Americans don't realize that rather than going out if, and I will not use exact figures, if Peru has a external debt to the United States of one dollar, it may be able to be purchased for 30 cents right now or less. And so the United States may very well be able to, quite frankly, very cheaply, go out expending many fewer dollars and giving much greater relief to your countries financially. And I realize Colombia is the least in need of this type of arrangement. And the more countries we can get involved in this, the better. And it also has, I think, a serious social benefit of us not dictating to your countries. And we have learned full well Peru's um, understandable uh, and very jealously guarded um, nationalism. Uh, and I mean that, I don't mean that as a criticism. And so we always have faced the problem in the past of the United States coming down and telling you what must be done with the dollars that is forthcoming. And it would be a way, quite frankly, to avoid that. Now, Senator, my question is this. Senator Thurman laid out what in the scope of world debt is a relatively small amount of money. We are going to spend over $10 billion this year in this country on drug efforts. And we're talking about a total debt that is a third of that, probably, in terms of external debt to the United States. So, my question is, have you made any entrees to any European governments about this concept or to the Canadian government if you are free to tell this committee? And if you are not, I understand you may not want to speak to that. Has this notion, this concept, been explored with any other of the industrialized nations that hold this debt? Any one of you? Well, <clears throat> if I may uh, I start to answer your question, Senator. In the first place, the more I hear you about the Biden plan, the explanations, the implications, the different aspects of it, the more I like it. The more convinced I am that it is a very good thing for us, for my country. But to, uh, to answer very concretely your question, uh, in talking about it, we find the obstacle of certain skepticism as how the administration in the United States is going to take this initiative uh, and it's whether this is going to be converted into the law. Uh, and this I, is, am, I am wondering that myself. <laughs> <laughs> and this prevents uh, a serious uh, dialogue with our creditors in Europe. Or, I see. Or, Valid, or, or, or kind Valid of. point. For the record, I might want to point out what my staff just handed me. Last year's total aid package to your three countries relative to this issue was about 281? 281 million dollars. The total debt service, the annual debt service to the United States of all three of your countries combined is only 270 million dollars. It is less than the total amount of the aid package. Um, I uh, I'd like to uh, move on, if I may, and address uh, a few more issues here. <coughs> Would uh, either of the ambassadors from Peru or Bolivia be willing to describe for us the experience that your governments have had with forced eradication efforts. Ambassador Crespo, you started to do that a moment ago when you were speaking to Senator Thurman. 
what are the ramifications when eradication is not accompanied by efforts to provide economic aid? Um, when enforcement and interdiction efforts are not targeted at traffickers and processors, but at the farmers in the field. Um, have, uh, have, has the effect been the reduction of the price of the uh, uh, coca leaf? In other words, if we want to drive the price down so it's no longer useful for farmers to grow coca, is it more successful in eradicating or is it, maybe, I'm, I'm getting too complicated here. When you eradicate, what happens to the price of the coca leaf in your, in your country? Does the price go up or does the price go down? Well, uh, to begin with, we feel that eradication alone is not a solution. According to our experience in the last two years, and uh, because there was a three-year program uh, carried out between the United States government and our government to eradicate so many hectares of coca leaf production. The results per se have not been good because eradication went only alone. Uh, $2,000 were paid for each hectare eradicated. And we found out later that two, those $2,000 picked up by the peasant served to plant two other hectares of coca later on. That's why the amount of land with the coca cultivation increased by 20% last year. Now, we think that eradication, uh, together with some economic alternative development, would give a very good result. Because eradication, in a way, discourages other people to, to plant uh, coca leaf. Now, as far as the price is concerned, unfortunately, the price of coca leaf is very inelastic. Sometimes it goes up and sometimes it goes down. At this very moment, and I have uh, information from Bolivia, it's a very low price, and historically it's never been that low, probably because of the um, things made for to interdict and the well, captured people and as I told you before, we're burning a ton of cocaine today, and that's probably the price went down. But I could not assure you whether tomorrow we'll have that same price or will it will go up. So it varies. My impression is this, and I'd appreciate your comment on this, all of you, that when we only focus on eradication, the effect is that the price has historically gone up more farmers are brought into it, attracted to the higher price because of the relatively low living standard that exists for farmers to begin with. But when it is coupled with, and I might not only compliment both your governments, but the government of Colombia, by this significant effort to deal with processing the processors and the traffickers, when you're successful in attacking there, the effect is that the price goes down. And so it seems fairly clear to me, and I may be wrong, I'd like you to comment on it, that there must be three different prongs to this effort. One, even without more innovative alternatives, we do best when we attack the processor and the trafficker driving the price down of a coca leaf if we are prepared at that time and moment to step in and give the farmers who now have the price driven down additional aid or additional alternatives so that they don't stay in that area they don't stay in that growing pattern, giving us in turn then an opportunity to decapitate some of these organizations because of what happens to their organizations. And so 
the proposals, the reason why I'm so attracted to your proposal, and I must admit I'm in a minority, uh, Mr. Ambassador, about purchasing, that a combination of all of these things must occur almost simultaneously to be able to make any real impact as we move along. Is that your general impression or am I missing something Not here in terms of the dynamic of the trade? Absolutely. That's true. At the beginning, at the beginning you say in a very you said in a very penetrating way that this proposal of course did not try to make a permanent type of of it. The existence of uh, eradication, especially through chemical uh, herbicides, is declining. They are now you hear more talk about crop substitution. But as you very well know, Senator, one doesn't need to be an agricultural expert to, to know that crop substitution cannot be produced overnight. The eradication process comes by the substitution of crops. And you will be able to substitute if you have the farmers on your side interested in doing so. And they will, absolutely they will, especially if you create the infrastructure, the agri agro-industrial superstructure, which will guarantee to them that all the products, be it cocoa, be it coffee, be it rice, which is 1,000 different products that can be grown in there, will have a value added which will compensate, far compensate, the prices for coca leaves and provide the basis of real, solid economic and social development. There has to be some place to sell this additional or alternative crop, though. And in our discussions, let me raise this issue. In our discussions, although it's different, fundamentally it's not different than what happens in America when agriculture finds itself in trouble, not with regard to coca, but when it finds itself in trouble with regard to plummeting prices, or when in small agricultural communities, the local plant that makes batteries for automobiles, or that makes uh, um, tractors, or that uh, makes fan belts for tractors or whatever, when that closes down, there's a problem. And we in this country have set up and have a number of experiments, some successful, some not so successful, whereby we found that sometimes it is useful to attempt to provide rural agricultural communities with alternative economic possibilities that don't relate to agriculture directly. But in your countries, as I understand it, as it is in all countries, in your countries, you need the infrastructure. If you were going to build a plant that made widgets or made some product, fictional product, one of the impediments to doing that now is there's not roads, there are not the proper infrastructure to get in and out of those communities. And it is my hope that with a debt forgiveness plan, that the measure of your sincerity and the willingness of us to rip up the mortgage, if you will, would relate not merely to you eradicating coca, but making a significant investment in rural communities that relates to water, sewer, roads, infrastructure, to provide those communities with an opportunity to maybe not be totally reliant upon agriculture. Now, that's a difficult task, but is that one of the things that when you talk about crop substitution, you're not merely talking about moving from growing coca to growing coffee or growing coca to growing rice. Am I correct? 
I, I would note for the record there are three assenting nods. <laughs> yeah, look, uh, uh, besides, excuse me, uh, Senator Biden, uh, uh, regarding to the market for products that could be grown in the Amazon, uh, Amazon jungle, in the Peruvian jungle, let me tell you, the Peruvian country itself would be a market. Today, we are importing products that could be grown in there. And the, the, the reason for this contradiction is, the, as you have very intelligently pointed out, the lack of infrastructure. So we wouldn't work, uh, worry too much about market for this product. Drug traffickers have no problem taking a machete and making a road through the jungle to get to the product to sell it because of the high value. But you're not going to get a company to make a contract with farmers in a rural area for a product that is required for a legitimate product that they would sell on the market in your country because there's no roads to get in. There are no, there's not a sufficient electrical capability, water, etc. Is that what you're saying? The, uh, yes, besides the traffickers use planes, yes. <laughs> which the, the people cannot afford. Of course we, they do. We go by foot into the jungle while the traffickers go by planes directly into the land and streets to God knows how they, they are able to build. Because the value added, as you pointed exactly. out, is so extravagant right. that they can do that. Okay. Let me move Excuse to me. another area. Oh, I'm sorry. Just to support what you have said, uh, I'm going to read just a paragraph of the statement. It seems as follows. Further to the moratorium and reduction of the government-to-government -government debt proposed in Senator Biden's bill, the remainder of the annual principal and interest payment of the debt to the United States or to an industrialized country should be exchanged for local funds that would be used to mitigate the immediate social impact of coca cocaine substitution without creating inflationary pressures. In the case of Bolivia, these funds would be used by the social compensatory fund mentioned previously. And we mentioned the creation of this fund in order to build roads and infrastructure to help peasants to commercialize their products and also miners. So Quite frankly, I think for presumptuous to me to suggest what your country should or should not do, but it seems to me that you're absolutely correct because if you merely go eradicate and give no alternative, you are only going to push farmers into the arms of those, whether they are drug traffickers or radical extreme political factions, because they have to make a living. They have to have somewhere to go. Now, one of the problems we have in this country, which I believe the administration is trying mightily to correct, and one of the reasons why I authored this bill that became known as the drug czar, creating that post, was that we found over the last 15 years of my experience dealing with this, that sometimes, to use the colloquial expression, the right hand didn't know what the left hand was doing. And we wanted to coordinate policy. Now, I am hopeful, although not overly optimistic based on the past track record at this point, that our trade representatives will understand that they should be speaking to our drug czar, who should be speaking to the director of office of management and budget, so that we don't have one policy well intended from an American standpoint, representing American interests, I can fully understand why a president would say it would be useful to have Americans be able to buy coffee at a cheaper price. And I could understand from an American perspective why it would be useful for America to say Bolivia, I mean Brazil is not playing by the game fairly in the coffee agreement and try to help Guatemala and other smaller Latin countries. But that policy undertaken without discussing that policy with the left hand, which is how are we going to aid Indian countries, has resulted in a picture that you all have painted here that has been counterproductive. 
You indicated, Mr. Ambassador, for the country of Colombia, we're talking about a total aid package of roughly how much for Colombia? About 60 to 70 million dollars. Yet the total loss from the coffee agreement falling apart may be as much as 400 million dollars for you. Is that correct? Yes. About 600 million dollars in this year. 600 million dollars in one year. For the low prices of on coffee. So that the effect on your economy, the very thing that will allow you to redirect resources against drug trafficking operations, has been for every dollar we have come forward with, a policy that we supported in another arena has cost you ten dollars, roughly. Well, I hope the administration is listening because although I think standing by itself <coughs> the position our trade representatives taken on coffee may make sense standing next to a drug eradication and a drug effort it may make no sense the unintentional undermining of our drug strategy by the coffee agreement our position in the coffee agreement uh, I think must must change, but that's for the administration to decide, not me, although I can urge it. Let me shift to another area and I will let you gentlemen go. And that is, all three of you and all three of your countries have been very straightforward on two things. One has been that the, ex, that the weapon of choice by terrorists in your country have been American-made semi-automatic weapons. President Barkos made that plea to us when he was here. Both your presidents have spoken of that to the best of my knowledge, and you have as well. And the second area is that a significant portion of the chemicals required to be able to take the raw coca leaf and convert that into cocaine as is known on the street here in the United States of America requires a chemical reaction to take place where chemicals are used in a refining process if you will to produce this cocaine and that the bulk of those chemicals come from the United States. And you asked for, sought help, help may be the wrong word, pointed out to us how damaging that was and suggested to us that we should do what we can to stop that. And as a consequence of that, I, uh, um, the so-called precursor chemicals, and recognizing our duty to try to stop those shipments, uh, I participate, and others participated in passing a, a law that imposes very tight, in 1988, that imposes very tight controls upon chemical exports from this country. Unfortunately, the U.S. does not have the enough, in my view, enough drug agents to crack down on these shipments. And though most of the U.S. industries, in my opinion, are complying with the new law, others practice what we call willful blindness by shipping these chemicals to suspect companies. Now, let me be very blunt with you. One of the impediments that we have run into, although we have toughened the law, has been on the parts of some of your governments, the unwillingness to let us follow up in your countries on whether or not these suspect companies to which the drugs were shipped are in fact front organizations for traffickers. And I am told by some in this administration and reason to believe it's true, 
that because of the strong feelings of nationalism and non-intervention by the United States in terms of your internal affairs, we have not been able to be as successful in stopping those chemicals because we have not, you have not had the personnel to follow up at your end because of the requirement to deal with other elements of this problem. And there's been an unwillingness to have the Drug Enforcement Agency more deeply involved in investigating companies in your countries. Is my assertion essentially correct or am I mistaken? And if it is correct, can you tell me what we can do, what you would suggest we do to enable us to follow the shipment of these chemicals to the source, the companies in your country who we and you may believe to be, in fact, uh, at least they are suspect companies, that they may not be using it for legitimate purposes. I'd be delighted to hear from anyone. Else. Yes. Como usted lo ha dicho, el presidente Barco y el gobierno de Colombia particularmente han insistido en el control de las armas automáticas y semiautomáticas que son usadas por los narcotraficantes y las guerrillas de Colombia y también en el control de los químicos precursores de la fabricación de cocaína. As you have well said, uh, President Barco and the Colombian government had particularly insisted on the control of automatic and semi-automatic weapons which are being used by the drug traffickers and the guerrillas against uh, Colombian government forces. And also on the curtailment of shipment of precursor chemicals. En las investigaciones que se han realizado en Colombia con el concurso de los agentes de la DEA, se ha descubierto que el 80% de las armas decomisadas a los narcotraficantes son fabricadas en los Estados Unidos o en otros países de empresas subsidiarias de compañías americanas o usando patentes americanas. Y lo mismo ocurre con los químicos precursores. In some investigations that have been done in Colombia with the cooperation of DEA agents, it has been found that about 80% of the arms that have been confiscated in Colombia to traffickers had either been manufactured in the United States or had been bought in third countries uh, where they had been produced by companies that were subsidiaries of American companies or using uh, patents belonging to American companies. And it is the same case regarding precursor chemicals. La Comisión, el Subcomité de Investigaciones del Senado, presidido por el Senador Non, hizo a ese respecto una minuciosa investigación y obtuvo muy interesantes datos sobre este punto. The investigation subcommittee of the Senate, chaired by uh, Senator Nunn, made a very careful investigation on this particular point and came up with very interesting results. Comprendo que el control para el despacho de armas y de precursores químicos Es bastante difícil, pero no imposible. Naturalmente sería un atrevimiento que yo, por ejemplo, me pusiera a dar lecciones al gobierno americano de cómo pueden hacerse esos controles. Yo creo que aquí deben tener gente experta 
para esa clase de procedimientos y naturalmente nosotros, por lo menos yo, no podría indicar nada nuevo al respecto. I understand that the control of the export of both arms and chemicals is a very difficult thing to do. And uh, it would be very daring of me to try to tell the United States how to go about uh, doing that control. However, I do believe that the United States must have the expert individuals to do this control properly. subscribe completely to what uh, Ambassador Mosquera has said about the subject. I would like only to add that uh, I certainly don't believe that it is the nationalistic feeling in my country or our very well known opposition to the intervention of foreign uh, powers into our affairs. Uh, in this respect, I think many others, the cooperation with the authorities of the United States and authorities of European countries has been very close, has been very close, and we have opened every possibility in helping to try to trace the source of criminal actions, be it in the importation of weapons or chemicals, whatever. I think, respectfully, that the source of shipment is the place where more of the, most of the investigation should be made. Uh, Mr. Senator, in the case of Bolivia, fortunately we don't have uh, much problem with weapons in the sense that uh, <coughs> narco traffickers or peasants in this sense uh, do not use uh, um, modern weapons. But in any case, my suggestion would be that the weapons should be controlled at the point of origin where they made and manufactured. It's easier that way. On, uh, precursors and chemicals. In Bolivia, although there is a free economy and free importations at this moment, one of the few things uh, that you have to get uh, special permission for the government to import are specifically these, these chemicals that some of them are used for industrial purposes. So for these precursors you need a special permission for the government. Now the traffickers and the um, producers of cocaine paste base, they usually use precursor chemicals that import and are smuggled through third countries in Latin America. Well, I won't belabor the point, but let me just suggest, you gentlemen, that you may ask the appropriate agencies within your own governments, uh, back at home, and it may just be my concern, uh, but I uh, have a feeling that Although, uh, Ambassador, the major requirement is to attempt to control at the source, we have a dilemma. We, I believe we are beginning to do that. And I believe most American companies are adhering to the new law that we wrote. But we have a dilemma. As Ambassador Crespo points out, there are legitimate uses for these companies, uh, for these chemicals, by companies in your countries. And a major concern is that halting U.S. chemical shipments to that, the Andean region, would hurt those legitimate industries. So we run into difficulty where we have what we call this willful blindness, where there is a company in your country, registered in your country, that our drug enforcement people think may be a company that is not a legitimate company is fronting for these agencies, but cannot make the judgment here. We don't know that. Only you can know that, whether the company is legitimate or not legitimate. And uh, I think we're going to find we're going to have to work more closely together on that piece. But let me step back from that and end with just, uh, and I will not keep you more than five, ten more minutes maximum. And I, um, with regard to guns, although President Bush has proposed to make it illegal to uh, assemble or import these kinds of guns into the United States, he's not yet uh, uh, endorsed a proposal like the one that I've introduced uh, this term of the Congress 
to ban uh, these lethal weapons uh, being sold to other countries. And I'm hopeful that he may come around to conclude that that would be a useful thing. But we have not resolved that debate here in our country, and uh, we will attempt to do that. I really actually only have, I have a number of other questions I'd be like to ask to submit in writing to your, to your staffs for you to consider because I've kept you so long, only because this is such an important subject. Um, uh, but uh, I, I have one question for uh, you, Mr. Ambassador, uh, with regard to flowers you mentioned earlier. And I would proceed my question by saying the United States may have legitimate reasons to protect American producers of flowers and florists. I don't know enough about the issue to make that judgment. And that if it does, that at least should understand by taking the action that it is proposing, which in fact uh, would uh, retroactively impose uh, high costs on your flower producers, that at least they should uh, understand the impact that's going to have in your country and make up for it somewhere else. Having said that, my understanding is that your country and the flower producing your country have cut out a very profitable niche in the American market that heretofore had not been addressed by American flower growers. And that was mainly in our supermarkets, low cost, cheap flowers that would may, may be made available. Now, I may be wrong about that. And I see a staff person behind you shaking their head no. Uh, what is the major market that Colombian flowers, what, what is the major market it, it, it satiates or addresses here in the United States? Maybe I could ask that question first. The major market? What's wrong? El mercado de flores de Colombia en los Estados Unidos significa alrededor de 160 millones de dólares al año. Nosotros no es que nos opongamos a que se proteja a la industria nacional, a la producción nacional de flores, entre otras razones porque nosotros estamos seguros de que en el mercado americano caben no solo los productores de flores americanos, sino los de Colombia y los de muchos otros países del mundo. Las flores colombianas tienen especial aceptación porque son muy hermosas, son muy bien cultivadas y los floricultores saben igualmente cómo exportarlas. El problema no es ni siquiera en que se apliquen los sistemas para controlar el dumping, sino que consideramos que esos sistemas son antitécnicos por la sencilla razón de que a nosotros se nos aplica el procedimiento teniendo en cuenta los precios de los Estados Unidos que son muy variables de acuerdo con la demanda que es aquí muy caprichosa según las celebraciones que en este país se tienen de diferentes días, el Día de la Amistad, el Thanksgiving Day and, y otros. Y se hace la comparación de los precios, que es muy variable en los Estados Unidos, con la comparación de los precios en Europa, que no es muy variable. Además, yo he aprendido que en Holanda 
que es uno de los principales países productores de flores, el mercado de las flores tiene precios diferentes en un solo día. Hay un reloj que va marcando los diferentes precios de las flores cada día y puede llegar el momento en que se vendan a más bajo precio que el de costo en un solo día. Uh, the U.S. market for flowers is worth about $160 million per year. We are not opposed to regulations that are designed to protect American producers, domestic producers. Um, in fact, we do believe that the U.S. market is large enough to allow for the competition of American producers, Colombian producers, and producers from several other countries. We are not even opposed to the application of an anti-dumping statute. However, the way in which the statute is being applied now with regard to Colombian flowers is something that we consider anti-technical. Colombia flowers are very competitive they are well appreciated in the American market because of their beauty, because of the very careful way in which they are raised, because Colombian exporters have taken very good care, know how to place their flowers in the market very quickly. They are not cheap, but they are inexpensive. Probably got your attention. I didn't mean it that they were not quality. I and um, as part of, part of the technical use of the anti-dumping statute, um, there's, they are making a comparison between the U.S. market, which is uh, very, in, uh, very changing. The prices vary radically. They are very seasonal, uh, depending on different holidays, such as uh, St. Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and so on. Um, and they're comparing that with the European market, which has a tendency to be much more stable, using different time frames. Uh, I have learned from my personal experience that uh, sometimes in a market, uh, take for instance the flower market in Holland, uh, prices vary within the day. There is a clock um, that marks time and as time passes uh, prices begin changing within the hour so that's our basic qualm well I didn't mean to imply that the flowers were cheap in terms of their beauty or their what I meant to imply my understanding was that that Columbia flower marketers and growers have been wise enough to decide that a major outlet for Colombian flowers could be through supermarket chains and that was an area that American growers had not heretofore focused on and that that is the basis of the major element of your marketing capability in this country but I guess I'm gonna that, this will get us too far afield um, and I should stay out of the flower field for a moment and and discuss that with you at another time because I've kept you so long I have one last question and that's to you uh, uh, Ambassador uh, Atala we truly appreciate your willingness and your government's willingness to allow you to testify today. Um, and I have a question you may not want to answer. You explained at the outset that notwithstanding our strong disagreement and your recall because of the situation in Panama and our actions in Panama, that you believe the drug issue was so important to all of us that you were willing to cooperate in that effort. Is this any indication that President Garcia may be willing to participate in the upcoming drug summit? I certainly hope so. But I cannot assure you that this will be the case. <coughs> As the, um, I, I think it will depend mostly on what the American military authorities will decide in the coming weeks. Uh, well, I sincerely hope so too because you are you, President Garcia, and your country are such a critical part 
of any solution. Um, I would hope that notwithstanding our strong disagreement uh, over uh, our actions in Panama, which I must bluntly tell you I support and support it, uh, notwithstanding our personal agreement on many other areas, I sincerely hope notwithstanding that, that uh, uh, President Garcia will uh, decide to participate. One member of the Senate implores him to do so, um, and uh, I, uh, I am optimistic, um, as I guess all of us have to be in the business in which we engage ourselves. Gentlemen, would any of you like to make a closing comment now that you've been here for almost, uh, you've been here two and a half, almost two and three quarters hours without getting a chance to even get up and move around? I'd be delighted to hear from you. Yes, Mr. Brasser. Yo quisiera, antes de terminar esta muy interesante audiencia, decirle al senador que su plan, como ha visto, ha despertado gran interés entre nosotros y que ojalá pueda realizarse. En el supuesto de que ese plan se realice, repito, que solo favorecería indirectamente a Colombia porque nosotros no tenemos un gran problema en lo que se refiere a la deuda pública. Uh, before finishing this very interesting hearing, I would like to say to you, Senator, that uh, your plan has awakened a lot of interest and that uh, it is our hope that it will be, uh, become a law. Um, I would also like to add that the direct effects of the plan in Colombia wouldn't be as substantial because we do not have a major problem with our foreign debt. Pero además, en cuanto al mecanismo operativo del plan, a mí me gustaría saber, por ejemplo, en el caso de realizarse, cómo se haría las compras de la deuda o en qué forma se tendría Colombia que corresponder al esfuerzo que se haga para comprar su deuda. Porque veo muy claro que en los países productores de materia prima se puede ir dosificando la entrega o los instalamentos de las cuotas correspondientes a las amortizaciones de capital e intereses según los esfuerzos que se vayan haciendo en la erradicación de los cultivos. Pero en Colombia, ¿cuáles serían nuestros esfuerzos? ¿Cómo se calcularía eso por el número de personas que capturemos o extraditemos? With regard to the operating mechanisms, uh, we would be very interested to know how the buying of our debt is going to uh, be handled and particularly how our efforts are going to be measured uh, corresponding to the amount of debt that is purchased. Uh, because for the other countries, um, the disbursement of the uh, purchased debt can be controlled um, according to how much is done uh, in the field of eradication. In the case of Colombia, how is that going to be accomplished by the numbers of people who are apprehended or who are extradited? Let me respond to that very quickly. Um, the UN Fund for Drug Abuse Control is the mechanism I've envisioned as the, if you will, the, um, uh, the negotiator on that issue as to determining, setting what in fact is a reasonable return for the effort, what constitutes it. In your country it may be elimination of laboratories, in your country it may be moving, uh, in, e in either of the two most uh, producing countries it may be the effort uh, measured by uh, the government's willingness to divert resources into rural communities, uh, and that is to be negotiated 
And I must tell you up front, as you well know, I have yet to convince the administration of this position. I am pleased and flattered by your support and interest. Uh, I believe all these things can be worked out. I have a very detailed approach, none of which cannot be improved upon. As I said, I have no pride of authorship. If there's a better way of doing it, I'm delighted to have it done. And I just hope maybe our discussions here today may click the interest of the, uh, of the administration and maybe diminish the fears and concerns of the Treasury Department and maybe make it on to the agenda at the summit. But uh, we have to start someplace, and uh, you've been very helpful in helping that at least get a higher profile so that we can begin to discuss it in more detail. And by the way, while I'm speaking to you, Mr. Ambassador, I'd like to the record to show that Eduardo Munoz has been the translator, and uh, he is exemplary in his capabilities. I uh, noticed that he does not take a note, uh, and uh, he uh, waits for long periods to transpire, and flawlessly translates because, at least based on the expression on your face, uh, he apparently flawlessly translates uh, what you said. I, it's been a tour de force. Congratulations. I, I want to thank you very, very much. Thank you. Gentlemen, either of you have a closing comment? I will be very brief in my closing statement, Senator Biden. <clears throat> I am very aware of being inadequate to give advice to the American administration. Of course, I support what my friend, the ambassador of Bolivia, has said in that respect. But I would rather make a few comments. Uh, as a sincere friend of the United States. As a sincere friend of the United States. And as a great admirer of the democratic accomplishments of this country. I felt sad that the enormously high posi moral position that this country attained as a result of the disaster of the totalitarian systems in Europe very recently had been in a way In little shadow because of the events in, in Panama from our point of view. But uh, I am very hopeful that uh, if some of the 1,000 lights have gone off as a result of this, I hope, I look forward, I feel sure that President Bush and his gentle view of the world affairs will see to it that will move the switch on and as soon as possible. Put the switch on, you say, as soon as possible. Yes. Well, I, uh, I believe President Bush is completely sincere. I guess from the President's perspective, if he could have timed what he felt had to be done differently, it would have been better but in my view, given the alternative that he had and faced with the circumstance that he was, all decisions are difficult. I believe he made the right decision, but I respect your country's strong and deeply felt opposition to that. And, uh, but like you, I hope we can uh, both turn the light switch back on uh, and, uh, and maybe the place to begin to reestablish that kind of cooperation may very well be in an issue that, as you point out, can and will do disastrous, awful damage to both our countries unless we, we uh, are able to impact on it. So, uh, and again, I want to thank you personally, Mr. Ambassador, for being so cooperative and, willingness and willing to speak with me and make that trip to my office so many times as you have to discuss in detail some of these issues. Uh, and that goes for you too, Mr. Ambassador, and I look forward Ambassador Crespo, for to getting to know you better since you've been here, but would you like to make a, a closing statement? Yes, uh, just to mention that, um, well, you have received an unanimous support for your initiative from the three ambassadors present here, and I would say that uh, we are all are willing to uh, keep on helping you, giving you more economic data, up to the date situation of our debts, and what have you. So. We are in this sense at your disposal because we, hear, we think it's a great initiative and that should, a law should be enacted with your bill. 
Now, since you, well, you mentioned that we've been almost three hours, uh, and you've been listening to us for three hours, we can, so we can now relieve you to. From no, it's no relief. It's been an education. Mm -hmm. It's been a great education for me, and I mean that sincerely. And uh, I, I really believe, I truly believe, that over the next several years, we're going to continue to make progress on this drug issue. I am not only committed to it, I'm convinced that it can be done. And I thank you all for your help. I thank the patience of the press and, the, uh, and everyone else here. Uh, the hearing is adjourned.